All right. We thank God for everyone being here today. Thank God for the opportunity to be able to come before you and to be able to minister the word of God to you all. If you have your Bibles, let's go to the eighth chapter of John. We're going to get right into the word of God. The eighth chapter of John. All right, we're going to start reading at verse 30. It says, as he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Now, I want you to notice here in verse 31, it says that Jesus is talking to the people that believed on him. Now, he had already been preaching uh, for quite a while. And the, some of the people didn't believe and some of them believed. So he turned to the people that believed. And says, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. He's talking to those people that already believed. So that means that you can start off believing in God. If you don't continue in his word, you're not his disciples, according to this, to this, what we read here. You see that? So he's talking to those people that believed. In other words, what is this saying? That is not enough for us to just believe. We have to continue in his word. We have to continue. Let's keep reading here. Verse 32 says, and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Now, that's he's talking about present. He's talking about future. You, if you continue my word, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Oftentimes, so many churches today, they God may have revealed the truth to them or their forefathers, you know, of, of that particular church or denomination years and years ago. But they don't continue. In God's word. In other words, we have the revelation on grace, but we're not going to get any other revelation. We're just going to sit on this revelation. And there's so much more to God than his grace and his mercy. It's so much more to him than that. And so what happens is people just they sit on whatever it is that God had revealed to them. And that's where they stay at. And that's not God's intention. Why? Because there are other levels that God want to bring you to. And so just because God have begun a work in you, that doesn't mean, well, we we've, we've we have a relationship with God now. Everything is fine. We don't need to move any further. And that's that's wrong. We're supposed to have a mind to continue to grow in the Lord. And a lot of times people will say, well, I'm not where I used to be. God had revealed this to me about me or whatever. And so I'm not where I used to be. And that's understandable. But at the same time, God doesn't intend for you to stay in the middle ground there. You know, in other words, in the place where I'm not where I used to be. God want to bring you on into his glory, not stay put and not just look back and reminisce over how, how you aren't where you used to be. That's not good enough for God. And we're going to look at that. We're going to look at that even in depth uh, as we move forward. Verse 33. Now, God have already the Lord have already told them, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. In other words, if you continue in my word, the only way you can experience the freedom that I have for you is if you continue in my word. And then when truth is revealed to you, you will become free. Let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 33 says, they answered him, we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free. Now, you see, they get offended. They got offended. The people who we just read about in verse 30, those same people believed. In verse 30 and 31, the very people who believed in him, when Jesus presents the idea that they are in bondage because that's basically what he's telling them. You're in bondage. But if you continue in my word, you should be made free. Why would you tell somebody? If you continue in my word, you shall be made free. If they are already free. You wouldn't do that. So the, the picture here is this is that the people were in bondage. They had no idea that they were still in bondage, what, uh, that they were in bondage. And so look at their response. They answered him. We be Abraham's seed. And were never in bondage to any man. How says thou, ye shall be made free? You see? And so they had a problem with what Jesus told them. Now, they, what happened? They done got offended now. The same people who believed in him, what we just reading here, how he turned to the people that believed on him and told them, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed? Those very same people that believed in him, now they are offended. 
And they're saying, how, why, why are you telling us we shall be made free if we're not bound to anybody? Let's go ahead and keep reading. Jesus answered them, verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. Now, Jesus isn't talking about being bound to any man. He's talking about being bound by sin. You see, let's keep reading. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Now, what is he saying here? That many people are walking around. They're in church. They're, you know, they believe in God. They believe that the Lord died for their sins, but they are still bound by sin. Now, what does it mean when, when we say bound by sin? When you're bound by something, you're in jail or you, you're incarcerated some kind of way and you do not have the freedom. You don't have the authority to get yourself out of jail. Everybody understand? You don't have that authority to do that. You don't have the power to get yourself from under the bondage of sin. It took Jesus Christ. That's why he said, whom the son set free is free indeed. You don't have that authority to set yourself free from sin. You don't, because if you had that kind of authority, if we were just given that, then we, Jesus Christ never would have had to come in the first place. So we don't have that authority. We have to depend on Jesus Christ. But here is the thing. The problem that Jesus ran into with these particular Jews, the Jews that believed on him, is the same problem that Jesus have today with people. And what is that? Admitting that they are bound by sin. See, they didn't want to admit that they were bound by anything. They didn't want to admit to it. They just, you know, who, what, what are you talking about? We're bound. We've never been bound by anything. We're not, we haven't been bound by man. We haven't been servants to man. And Jesus said, oh, yes. If you commit sin, then you are the servant of sin. In fact, we read when the angel of God appeared to Mary. He told Mary when he told her about the, the child that she would bear for God. What did, he, what did that angel say? That he shall save many from their sins. He shall save the world from their sins. You see that? So you people, so when people say, I am saved, what, what does it mean to be saved? What are you talking about? You're saved. Everybody understand? Well, you can't walk around saying that you're saved if you don't know what you're saved from. When somebody get bailed out of jail, they can tell you what jail they were, they were in and they can tell you why they were there, why they were arrested. When, when, when somebody is arrested to even go to jail, the, the cops tell them what they're being charged with and why they're being arrested and what rights they have, you see. And so oftentimes people are in jail and don't even know it. But God wants us to know that if you are bound by sin, you are in jail. You are bound. And it's going to take his power to set you free. But the first thing we have to do is get rid of our pride and admit, Lord, I'm, I'm bound by this thing. Mm -hmm. I need your help. What, I don't care what it is. It may be pornography. It, it, it can be a number of things, a lying spirit or whatever it is. You know, and I've, I've ran into people with lying spirits. And I know, you know, it don't make any sense to lie that much. That's not natural. And there's some things that we as Christians deal with. That's not natural. And we have to admit there's another power at work here. Amen. There's something else that's causing me to be this. You know what? God didn't create you to be sinful. God didn't make you just bad. Everybody understand? Nobody come here just lying. Nobody come here just committing adultery and whatever it is, lusting and stuff like that. You don't come here doing those things. Now, don't get me wrong. The atmosphere is right for that to be there because the spirit of God isn't dwelling in you. But you don't come here as a child, as a baby doing those things. At some point when people get bound, it's because they have to yield themselves to that. And all the devil wants you to do is just yield a few times. And before you know it, you're bound. And, and the next thing is once he binds you and puts you in jail and puts you in the prison, now he's going to move you somewhere else. He's going to move you into a deeper part of that prison. What do I mean when I say that? Uh, the word of God tells us that when an unclean spirit is gone out of a man, in other words, when you have been delivered by something, delivered from something, and, and God have delivered you, that unclean spirit, it leaves, and when it goes out and it doesn't find anybody to get into, it comes back. And if it finds you have been swept and garnished, in other words, that you are empty, you don't have the Holy Spirit or the word of God abiding in you, 
Then it comes back and it brings seven more spirits just, it's stronger than he is himself. And that is the cycle that the devil wants people to get caught up in. To be delivered from something. And once you're delivered, to go right back into it. Mm -hmm. Delivered, praying God, God, if you set me free from this, I won't do it anymore. And then, you, you know, temptation come and then you go right back into it. And every time you go back into it, it comes, it becomes harder and harder to get out of it. Amen. Number one, because the devil, just like the word says, he brings seven more spirits. And, and this could be different spirits. Now you're opening the door for something else. And so now God has to deliver you from the other seven things and then get to that spirit that you originally started with, that you were praying about. And so that's why we can't, quote unquote, play with the devil. We can't play with those things. If you know it's wrong, don't do it. Because the whole point is the devil wants you bound. He wants you bound. And he knows that when he binds you, that it takes the power of God. First of all, it takes you to admit that you're bound. And so let's go. Let's go. If you if you have your Bibles, go to the uh, the book of Numbers with me. Okay, the 14th chapter of the book of Numbers. Fourteen chapter. We're going to look at the nature of people. 14th chapter of the book of Numbers, of course, in this we're dealing with the children of Israel. God have delivered them from the, from the Egyptians. Now, uh, it was prophesied, God had told Abraham that your people, your descendants, are going to go down in Egypt. And I'm going to turn the heart of the, their king against them and they're going to serve the Egyptians for 400 years. And then they're going to cry out to me and I'm going to deliver them. And so this is a picture of what happens with mankind. 14th chapter of Numbers. This is a picture of what happens with mankind. That we, we, you know, we realize that something is wrong. We want something better in our lives. We don't like necessarily being bound by whatever it is that the enemy may have us bound by. So what do we do? We cry out to the Lord. Lord, I want something better. Lord, I, I need a better experience. I need you in my life. And deliver me from this thing that, that is, has me bound. And deliver me from this. And so God answers the prayer. He delivers us. Now let's, let's read. We're going to start reading at verse 14. Now, in this delivery, now let me make this clear. When God have delivered us from something, the devil's not going to make it pleasant. In other words, we'll be set free. That's true. But the devil has a job to do, and his job is to make you try to make you miserable in that deliverance. In other words, there are going to be some hard times that you're going to come against. Delivery doesn't mean just a carefree life. It doesn't mean that you won't have any worries or any persecution or anything that you have to go through. It just means that you're no longer bound by the enemy, that you're no longer a slave to sin. Now, when you're a slave, let me make this clear. When you're a slave, you don't have a choice in the matter. You're a slave, and that's just the way it is. You're going to obey your master. And when you're a slave to sin, your master is the devil, and you're going to obey him. His works are you going to do. But when you have been set free, now you have a choice. Even after you have been set free, God will not violate your free will. And so we have to have a made-up mind not to go back into bondage. Let's go ahead. We're going to start reading at verse 1. It says, and all the congregation lifted up their voice. Now, let me tell you what have happened. They've gone into the promised land. Or they've looked at the promised land. They've sent those spies there, uh, 12 spies, each one from each tribe. Ten of the spies come back saying that um, there are giants in the land. We're not able to take them. And two of them, only Joshua and Caleb, came back and said, we can take the land. We can do it. God will deliver it to us. And so when they get there, right there to the doorway of the promised land, they get discouraged. And they start walking in unbelief. Now they're upset. And instead of them praying and asking the Lord, Lord, how is this going to take place? These are giants in the land. What do they do? Let's keep reading here. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried and the people wept that night. Why? Because they chose to believe the evil report of the majority. Instead of believing God. Now, God had already told them, I'm going to give you the land. He didn't tell them you're going to get you going to you're going to conquer the land. He said, I'm going to give you the land. That's a big difference. 
What does that mean? That God is saying, when I have said something, I'm going to do it. Not you. It's not going to be through your own effort. And this is the heart of deliverance. This is the heart of being set free. That's why Jesus said, whom the son, in other words, me. He's talking about himself. When I set people free, they are free indeed. Why? Because a lot of times we try to do it ourselves and then we go back right back into it, not being able to help it. And that's why I said that it takes the power of God for, to be truly delivered from those things that bound mankind, which is sin. Verse two says, and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron and the whole congregation said unto them, would God that we had died in the land of Egypt or would God we had died in this wilderness and wherefore had the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey were it not better for us to return into Egypt and you see when God have delivered us from something if we're not careful we'll take on a mindset of you know what we had a better life when we were out in the world and in your mind that might be true because the devil wasn't coming against you then you belong to him of course you didn't have him as an enemy in your mind you're already bound by him. All he has to do is just keep giving you whatever is, is, uh, feels good to your flesh. Amen. But when you, when you get delivered, now he has a job to try to get you back. And part, and part of that is him just trying to discourage you, trying to make it look like people out in the world got it better. You didn't run into these problems when you were, when you were serving me. Now, he ain't going to just come right out and say that, you know, when you were serving me. But that's basically what it is. You were serving him. OK, let's go ahead and keep reading. And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. You see that? And that's the mindset of people. We, we just wish we had just never left Egypt. If you remember, before God even delivered them out of Egypt, when they were still physically in Egypt, they were telling Moses to go on about his business. Why? Because Pharaoh didn't want to let them go. And he made their workload harder. Now. I don't understand how you pray for something. And then when God answers the prayer, you don't want it. And that's what happened to people. Got people pray for certain things. People want to be delivered. And then when God sends deliverance, I don't want it. Maybe they got a problem with who he sent it by. Maybe they got a problem with the way that he does it. Let's look at Naaman when uh, he had leprosy and, and his servant, his wife's servant said, there's a man, a prophet. In Samaria, that can recover you of that disease. He goes and, and sends his servant to Elisha. And Elisha just tells him, look, tell your master to go dip seven times in the river Jordan. He'll be clean. And Naaman had a problem with that. N Naaman's issue was, well, I don't come all this way. The least you could do is come out here and see me, lay hands on me or do something. And see, and what was, Naaman, what was Naaman's servant's response? Well, if he had told you to do some hard thing, you'd have done it. In other words, if you if you if, if you know, if deliverance was coming by yourself, then you'd have done it. If, if you have just if he have told you to jump up and down or something like that, you'd have done it. But because it's as simple as dipping yourself in the River Jordan seven times, you got a problem with it. And see, oftentimes deliverance does not come the way we want it to come. And so we have a problem with it. And God doesn't want us to have a problem with it. Don't go back into that yoke of bondage. The Bible tells us don't be entangled again in that bondage. Don't do it because every time you go back, you got seven more spirits that you have to deal with. And now you have seven more deliverances that God has to do. You see, and so when you open the door for one thing, you can just barely open the door just a little bit. The devil is just going to push it open on you. So let's not go back into that bondage. God is not pleased when we go back into something that we have been delivered from. And let me make this clear before we close. The children of Israel never returned into Egypt, not ever. From the time that God delivered them, they never, ever returned into Egypt. They wanted to make a captain to go back into Egypt. Moses prayed for them and God spared them. But here was the problem. In God's mind, it was the exact same thing as them going back because they went back in their mind. And that's what kept them from being able to, to inherit the blessings that God had for them. So what is it? What does that mean? All you don't even though you may not naturally go back to the things that God have delivered you from. If your mind is already there, then the devil has you already. Why? Because that will keep you from inheriting what God has for you to inherit here. After this, God pronounces this 
40 years of bondage, 40 years of being in the wilderness. It only took them 40 days to get there. But 40 years, in other words, I'm not going to allow this generation to go in. Why? Because they're my, even, when I, even if I let them go into the land, their mind is going to always go back to Egypt and what, the way it used to be. And see, so not only is it enough, it's not enough for God to just set you, your, your natural body free from whatever sins you were bound by. He also has to renew your mind and you have to allow him to do it. You have to start thinking a different way so that your mind can be renewed. The first thing that has to change is your mind so that you don't go back in your mind to those places. Why? Because for you to go back and sin, your mind have to go there first. Your body just ain't doing things. People don't just fornicate or commit adultery. They, they entertain it first. Amen. God has delivered us from that, so let's stay delivered. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this word, and Lord, we pray that something was said that will help us as we continue to walk in the ways that you have called us to walk in, God. Thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you for hearing our prayers, Lord, and we pray that you will give us the power to stay free from the sins that that you have delivered us from, Lord. And we pray over everyone under my voice, everyone that will listen to this message, Lord, that you will give them a grace, Lord. As soon as the enemy try to bring things to their mind or try to capture them, Lord, we ask that you remind them that they have been delivered and they don't have to go back into those things that they have been delivered from. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.